Uh, so we have case study. Um, we have, I'm going to bring the cadaver out towards the end. Um, but we also have our very last quiz, the Hissel Secrets. Okay? So this will probably take me to about 8.20 or so. And then we'll have, lab, we'll have the case study, and then we'll have lab time uh, to whenever you want to take the quiz. And then I'll bring the cadaver out and kind of take you through it in groups. And then any left, left time, leftover time, you can use to study models or study lecture material for Thursday. Okay. All right. So here we're looking at those three components: glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. And we're going to look at when we talk about pancreas and uh, insulin glucagon. As you probably already know, glucose levels are modified by insulin and glucagon, as well as some of the other hormones, but those are the primary ones. And as we talked about on Friday, glucose can be stored in the liver as glycogen. I just smiled last night. My daughter had us a research paper, the first draft of which is due today. And so at 8 o'clock, she asked me to read over it and edit it for her. And it was all that she's heard thing is in courses. So the whole paper was the effects of low fat, low, let's see, low sugar, low carb diets and high fat, high fiber diets on horses. So I can't get away from this stuff. <laughs> but we store glucose in the liver and then we release glycogen as glucose. And so glucose is, and she mentioned this in her paper, it's true for horses too. Glucose is the source of energy for neurons in the brain. All right. And the primary source, of course, is apparently if they get too much glucose, have bad behavior. Well, I think bad, but they get hot, um, uh, very hyperactive. And then muscle cells can use glucose as well, and amino acids and fatty acids um, can be utilized by muscle tissue. The heart, fatty acids, one of the heart is one of the main organs that uses fatty acids. So that's what's showing here, adipose tissue, so they're triglycerides we talked about. Those adipose sites have enzymes that can synthesize or break down uh, the free fatty acid, the triglycerides and free fatty acids. And then of course we have the proteins. So we're looking at the level. The body will break down proteins from muscle tissue to release as amino acids for fuel if it doesn't have other sources or hormones drive to go in that direction. Now, there's a couple terms that I neglected to put up when we were talking about metabolism. Anybody clue in on what those two words key we were talking about metabolism? Catabolic. Okay, so anabolic and catabolic are anabolism and catabolism. So let me just define those for you before we move on. <coughs> tricky for me. I always thought of anarchy as being without <coughs> form and structure. Uh, and that doesn't work here because anabolism is putting things together. And A means to me means without. <coughs> so I had to come about, up with a different way of uh, recognizing breaking down versus building. And so catabolism and catastrophe is how I put the, the terms together. So catabolism would be, uh, just as an example, Catabolism would be glycolysis. All right, so taking glucose and breaking it down, forming energy, and so on. And anabolism would be um, glycogenesis. So taking the glucose and putting it back in a storage form. All right, or taking amino acids and making proteins out of them. All right, so having laid down a little bit of a basis. Let's talk about our first hormone. And again, bless you. You're familiar with uh, these components. So we have the synthesizing organ is going to be the pancreas. And our hormone is insulin. 
So insulin is released under influence of sympathetic or parasympathetic. What did you say? So think when you're thinking about this, instead of just something that you memorize, remember parasympathetic is our rest and digest, slows cardiac activity down, but speeds up digestive, so it increases motility of the stomach. It causes the liver to increase synthesis of bile, and elevated blood glucose is a uh, absorptive state. That's what we do. That's what happens to our glucose levels as we eat. Glucose levels rise. So vagus nerve um, is active during that absorptive time, and so it is active on the pancreas um, in the release of insulin, as well as just elevated glucose levels themselves are going to increase um, insulin levels. Okay. So this fed state is the absorptive state, and so we, with the um, use of insulin, it affects the receptors that allow glucose to be transported into the cell. So this is for free. I'm not going to put this diagram up on the, I already told you what your extra credit was. All right. So with the effect of insulin, we get more glucose transporters is essentially what this diagram is saying. Okay. Therefore, more glycolysis can take place or certain uh, cells do not need the glucose transport. And that's why exercise down here to this table. That's why exercise can affect the glucose levels. Now, notice the slides are going by faster than my words. I told you I wasn't going to stay on all the slides. So this is what you need to know. So with insulin, we have a decrease in everything, right? So there's an increased protein synthesis. There's increase in lipid storage. And there's an increase in glucose uptake and formation which is glu as uh, glycogen. So this is one of the rare ones where everything is the same. So we're going to see a decrease in blood glucose levels as they're taken up, a decrease in fatty acids as lipids are stored, and a decrease in levels of amino acids as protein is built. is a post-absorptive state. Remember I wrote those terms on the board Friday? So absorptive is like within the first two hours of eating. And then after that, if you don't eat again, you're in the post-absorptive state. So as these levels drop, partly because we're using them and partly because of the effects of insulin, so if we don't eat anymore after that two hours, then we see a breakdown of lipids and a breakdown of glycogen so that we raise levels in the blood. So the interaction between these two hormones is to prevent the deep cravic cracks of low levels of blood sugars and very high levels of blood sugars, remember homeostasis. So we have slight rises and falls rather than sharp peaks. So our source is still the pancreas.
So essentially what growth hormone does is it, as some other hormones do as well, it sets aside glucose as the primary fuel use and switches the body's fuel use, in the case of growth hormone, to fats. So what's going to happen to glucose levels if we don't use them for fuel? It's going to go up. All right, so growth hormone, um, pituitary gland, <coughs> then it's going to increase blood glucose levels because they're not being utilized by the cells. It's going to increase fatty acids because it's taking fat cells and activating the lipase in the fat cells to release a monoglycerides and fatty acids, and this is what's being used as fuel. So growth hormone is great because it helps you lose weight. And it decreases amino acids because it's stimulating anabolism of protein. So you're taking amino acids out of the blood and making protein. You're building muscle. Okay. However, over a continued period of elevated glucose, elevated glucose is one of our stimuli for insulin release, and so you basically, quote unquote, wear out the pancreas with abuse of anabolic type steroids. So it's the continued high level of glucose effect on insulin that caused this particular guy to have type 2 diabetes, right, a lot earlier than he normally would have. So again, if you think of it making sense, glucose isn't used, so its levels remain high. Lipids and fat cells are broken down, releasing fatty acids to the blood. And amino acids are removed from the blood for protein synthesis. <laughs> okay, thyroid we already talked about at the very beginning. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the side effects. We covered that already. So the, the end result of thyroid hormone levels is it increases the mitochondrial production of ATP. So it's, its role in elevating, most of us know that if you're hyperthyroid, you feel hot, you have a lot of energy, you may even have diarrhea because your digestive tract is overactive, so on, okay? But the mechanism by which it does all of that is to increase the synthesis of ATP. So it's major focus is glucose. So insulin lowers glucose. Thyroid hormone, by the way, is the only other hormone that also lowers glucose levels. Every other metabolic hormone we're going to talk about elevates blood glucose levels. So insulin and thyroid hormone, it makes sense since we're using glucose to make ATP, are the only ones that lowers blood glucose. Before eight o'clock. Oh. You're like, why did I have to get out of bed? Pretty much. <laughs> I just practice job. Uh, that's what you could accomplish. Something with the rest of your day. So we've alluded to the adrenal gland a few times. By the way, pay attention to the source because it always surprises me every semester how many students miss the source organ for these hormones. Something I think is common knowledge. So pay attention to this. You don't want to miss that part of the table. The adrenal glands we have as a source for two different hormones. We have corticosteroids, cortisol, aldosterone, androgens that come from the cortex when we're going to be using cortisol. But there's another hormone, quote unquote, neurohormone that comes from the medulla. Epinephrine. Norepinephrine. Well, actually, epinephrine from the, from the adrenal gland. Okay? So we're going to we look at the histology of this. The medulla is usually, 
can only flip it, but the diagram this way has it. So remember the zone of glomerulosa? Uh, the, our loops of a smooth ER containing cells are near the capsule. That's aldosterone. Androgens are released close to the medulla. We haven't really paid attention to that, but uh, this as well as the ovaries are the source of androgens. In this middle area are the glucocorticoids, which uh, if you've bought an anti-itch cream, if you've got poison ivy or a lot of bug bites, and you've got a cortisone cream, that's coming from cortisol. Okay. So cortisol, you've probably, you've probably seen this as the stick figure ads for um, weight loss drugs and belly fat. And the, the woman is saying, I started exercising at the gym and you know, I lost weight and her drawings of her breasts get smaller. And you know, then I started doing this and uh, nothing happened. And by the meantime, the clothes are falling off her husband. Um, really just just drinking soda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. nothing happens for her. Um, so cortisol uh, is a anti-inflammatory. Steroids are given to individuals who have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they can be injected into joints, inflamed joints, or uh, other types of problems. It also suppresses the immune, that we have the mechanism by anti-inflammatories, it suppresses the immune response. So you'll hear ads on TV for various types of steroids, but they all usually follow them with don't start taking this medication, talk to your doctor, but don't start taking this medication if you're going to have surgery. Because of its suppression of wound healing. So, someone, when we talked a little bit about Cushing syndrome, I remember did we talk about this much at the very beginning? I did a little bit with the case study that we had on um, hyperprolactinemia and adrenal cortic cortical uh, uh, ATH <coughs> hormone uh, tumor in the brain. Pituitary gland was considered a possibility for that. So typically with Cushing's, Cushing's is too much cortisol. Okay, Addison's is not enough. Um, uh, the problem with the al aldosterone. Okay, Cushing's is too much cortisol. And um, typically the cortisol patient, if I could find it to draw it here, um, has a moon face because of uh, increased adipose tissue, a buffalo hump, um, very skinny, sorry for my drawing here, very skinny arms and legs. All right, the skinny arms and legs are due to the effect of cortisol on breaking down proteins. So it's using proteins for fuel rather than glucose. Okay? So glucose levels go up because other molecules are being used for fuel. Fuel, lipids and proteins are being used for fuel, saving glucose, if you will, quote unquote. So again, glucose levels are going to go up. Um, <coughs> as they're not being used, similar for growth hormone. Fatty acids are going to go up because fats are being broken down for fuel use instead, similar to growth hormone. But opposite of growth hormone, proteins are being broken down for use as fuel. Whereas in growth hormone, amino acids were being used to make new proteins, or amino acid levels went down. All right. So in, um, in this case, there's an increase in everything. So we have adrenal cortex, so glucose goes up because the body's not using it, lipids go, fatty acids go up because the body's breaking down fats for fuel, and amino acids go up because the body's breaking down proteins for fuel. All right, what is over that? So here's the, unfortunately, this is the characteristic appearance of the moon face, the redness in the cheeks, um, hirsutism, so increased facial hair growth, uh, striety, 
So there's the abdominal fat as well as that buffalo fat and then distension, uh, sometimes purple instead of just the uh, whiter shades here. So a lot of times this is what physicians look for before they consider Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome. Um, and the first time I really, I mean I've heard about it, but you know those mystery diagnosis shows on, on TV, medical diagnosis mystery shows, there was a, a woman who had had medical problems for about eight or ten years, had been seeing various physicians, she was overweight, and all her doctors kept telling her she needed to lose weight, and she would find that her medical problems would go away. And so she would go to the gym, and she'd work out, and nothing would happen, and none of the medical doctors believed that she was really working out because she wasn't losing weight. And um, she didn't have um, the, the typical striates, and she didn't have all of the signs. And um, it, was, it took about over 10 years before she found a physician that was willing, that thought about testing her for Cushing syndrome. And I don't know if you remember, but early on in the semester when we were talking about this in the reproductive endocrine unit, it's really tricky to, to test levels of of cortisol. They're highest in the morning, so you have to, you know, get to the lab early in the morning. Um, you have to do it over a period of time because it can be normal for a couple of months and then high for a month, so you can have cyclic levels of elevated cortisol, um, and it takes some persistence um, to follow through with this and looking for levels of cortisol, plus the sources could be the pituitary gland, the lung, the adrenal, the hypothalamus. There could be a variety of areas where the cause can be elevated. Um, and remember what, if the treatment is an adrenal tumor, then you do surgery there. If the treatment is a pituitary tumor, you do surgery there. There can be elevated cortisol from lung cancer. So it's a very tricky kind of pathway to try to follow this through. And our last. Okay, epinephrine. This is from the adrenal medulla. <sighs> in which the adrenal medulla is made up of postganglionic neurons <coughs> that don't develop <coughs> axons and so on. So their release is stimulated, sorry for the handwriting way at the bottom there. The release of epinephrine is stimulated by sympathetic neurons that directly release acetylcholine onto these cells, because remember they're postganglionic sympathetic, so they have receptors for acetylcholine, but they don't send out axons, and so their neurotransmitter, if you will, epinephrine is released into the blood. That's why it's classified as a hormone, although it's, um, it will bind to the same receptors as norepinephrine. So, this is one of these that does this. Now, cortisol and epinephrine, are, right, whose release are both uh, stimulated by exercise and stress. Um, I don't know if things change as you get older, but I remember when I was in high school, you know, the first high school crushes kind of thing, I could lose five pounds in a week just by falling in love. I mean, it just would melt off. And then as you get older, you have stress and you gain weight. So I don't know if that's, you know, a mechanism to make you more attractive when you fall in love or less attractive or I don't know. It just doesn't work the same way as you get older when you have stress. Um, so my daughter was under a lot of stress, her own doing, uh, a year ago, her home study courses that she kind of stuck her head in the mud. And, ignored and then got frantic the last six weeks and tried to pass five day classes and did succeed in but two of them. And didn't tell me about it until it was too late to do much about it, but watch her struggle to get a D instead of an F. And she lost a lot of weight. Now, if that had been me stressing out this you know, time, it wouldn't have worked the other way. I would have gained about 15 pounds. Um, but, again, it's switching, and this is, where it, this is where you lose the weight when you're switching the source of fuel to lipids, all right? Um, 
apply it, and then by not using glucose, glucose is elevated. So this is a little bit, when we don't use glucose, it goes up. When we do use fats, it goes up. So wait, wait a minute, because the fats are already stored, and they're being broken down and released into the bloodstream. Okay? Whereas the glucose is not being taken up, therefore its levels stay high in the bloodstream. Okay, it's in 12 minutes early. Our last formal new piece of information. All right? So recognize what's happening with the um, molecules. It helps if you really think about what's going on instead of just remembering up or down arrows. I know by putting it in a table form, I'm, I'm kind of leading you down that pathway to do that memorization. But if you think of the purpose and what's happening, um, it will help you remember those. Okay. All righty. So, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Case study. And then after the case study, when you guys, so we're done with the case study, approximately eight, well, eight forty. Give you, won't take you twenty minutes, but uh, when do you think you want to take the quiz? Ten? No. Obviously, we've got one vote. <laughs> I'll just wait till you guys tell me you're ready. Okay. I'd like to bring the cadaver out about 10.30. Okay? So those of you that aren't interested, aren't losing a lot of lab time if you want to leave. And those of you that are interested have sufficient time. Um, the part of the best dissection uh, that we have on the cadavers is the digestive system. So that's why I wanted to lose on top if I wanted to bring him out. Okay. So whenever you want to set up, the rest of you want to take a...